Welcome, everybody, to the Kona Shane Veterinary Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Andy Rourke. Guys, I am here with a uh, a really interesting episode. It's a, it's a bit of a heavy episode, but this is... Um, this is a lot of head candy. This is a lot to sort of chew on. Uh, it's a lot to kind of put in your mind and roll around and process. I am here with veterinary behaviorist, uh, Dr. Lisa Radosta, and um, we are talking about behavioral euthanasia. And the first thing she tells me is how she doesn't like the term behavioral euthanasia, and we should stop using it. And we just start from there. And anyway, this is a, a great thought-provoking interview. I am so glad that she came on and just talked through this with me. But um, I... I I love her perspective. I think she provides a lot of clarity in how to work with these cases and also how to feel okay about these cases and also to how to how to help pet owners feel more okay when they're going through a situation like this. So anyway, really good episode. I hope you guys are going to really enjoy it. Uh, Dr. Radasta throws out a bunch of uh, a bunch of really good resources and I link to them in the show notes so you can uh, check those out as well. Guys, let's get into this episode. This is your show. We're glad you're here. We want to help you in your veterinary career. Welcome to the Cone of Shame with Dr. Andy Rourke. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Elisa Radosta. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm great. I love having you here. You are uh, you're one of my favorite people to talk to. I have already been picking your brain. As soon as you arrived, I was like, I have questions for you. And I should have just hit record because you're amazing. But uh, you are, for people who don't know, you are a, a you are a fellow Florida Gator. Uh, you are a boarded veterinary behaviorist. You are the owner of Florida Veterinary Behavior Service. Um, you have been a guest on the podcast a number of times in the past, and you are a generally wonderful person to talk to. And so I have, I have, I have a question for you. It's not a fun question, but I think it's, I think it's really important. It's something that I, I've been rolling around uh, with with a little bit recently. I, I've seen some of these cases. I wanted to talk to you today a bit about behavioral euthanasia, the idea that we have behavior problems that have come to a point where the owners say, I cannot rehome this pet or I don't feel comfortable rehoming this pet. And I think this pet should be put to sleep because it's it's dangerous, some, um, something like that. Or yeah, let's just go with that. I think a lot of vet professionals really struggle with this idea. I've heard of clinics that just say we don't do behavioral euthanasia here. And I, I don't want I don't want to cast judgment. I, I want to understand. And so as I sort of to, to parse my own thoughts and sort of say, are there lines in the sand for me? Uh, I think everybody's got their own, but um, are there rules or a general general perspective or or even a philosophy to kind of look at these cases? I just I wanted to talk to you about it and start to get your insight as a behaviorist. Uh, let's just start really high up. Lisa, how, how do you think about these cases? Yeah. So if I may uh, turn things around and disrupt just a little bit. Sure. Right off the bat. So I, I want to lose behavioral euthanasia. And I want to just say euthanasia. Because the last time I checked, we didn't say kidney failure euthanasia, brain tumor euthanasia. No, we just say that patient was euthanized, right? Uh, so euthanasia is euthanasia. It's a choice to end suffering. And I think by taking the tag of behavioral off, we can start to open our minds to the suffering of animals with behavior problems, and we can begin to put it into the same bucket as all the other ways that animals suffer. I, I I like that a lot. That that makes uh you're already framing this up really really nicely. Let's let's go ahead and start to unpack where are the when you start to look at at cases that come to you and people say I have a Belgian Malinois and uh, I it's it scares me it's or it scares you know it scares my spouse um, and we've had some incidents uh, you know it, it bit one of the neighbors. Um, how do you start to look at those? Because, you know, obviously as a behaviorist, you, you have you have tools in your tool belt where you can work with this pet. And oftentimes I think that we we immediately want to fix the problem. How do you how do you start with that? So when you're looking at at the beginning of these cases and you know that euthanasia might be required if we can't make headway here, um, how, how do you start to set those cases up? How do you set expectations, things like that? Yeah, so the first thing is I recognize that behavior is different, whether it's at specialty practice where I am or in primary care. So when a pet parent comes to you and her her older cat is urinating everywhere 
she doesn't come to you with all of the advice from all of her neighbors to euthanize her pet. The advice, then go to your vet. My cat had hypothyroid. My cat had kidney. My cat, right? But when the dog bites someone, the advice starts coming in. You need to euthanize. I would never live with that dog. That dog's going to bite your kid, right? So all that advice feels really different. It's terminal advice. And so she comes, he or she, they come to our office with a lot of emotions. So the first thing I do is let them talk. Then I express empathy and I normalize what they're feeling. You know what? Because they say things like, and I'm scared. And I say things like, and if you weren't scared, I think you were really weird. Yeah. You should be scared. Your dog's 90 pounds. And he, I saw this case about a month ago, and he had bitten through both ladies' hands. Oh, gosh. But both her hands. Bitten. She's a graphic designer. Can't use her hands. And I said, you should be scared. And they, and they start at that point. You can see stress starts to dissipate. They're like, you get it. I'm like, of course I get it. Of course. Yes. You're normal. You're afraid of your dog. And then I also normalize, but you still love him. They're like, we do. Like normalize what they feel because that doesn't feel right. Why would someone that loves me hurt me? Right? Okay. But that's not what they think when their dog has lymphoma, right? They don't take it personal. Okay. So first we normalize, we express empathy. Number two, now we get into the ethics of who are we as veterinary healthcare team professionals. So ever since, I euthanized my first own pet. My first pet is an adult that I had to decide to euthanize. I knew in my heart that no one could make that decision for me. So I was in vet school, so my junior year of vet school. So from that, I've created this 23 years of veterinary practice. I refuse to tell someone when it's time because I feel for me, not no judgment of any other vet, for me, it feels disrespectful because that's not my family member, yet I am making a final decision. So I don't generally, nothing's 100%, I don't generally bring this up. Clients start to bring it up. They start to say, my friend said that I should euthanize him. I'm going to be sued, or I should put him to sleep, or cross the rainbow bridge, Mm -hmm. whatever we're going to call it. Then that gives me a chance to say, okay, let's, let's talk about options. What do we have on the table? So so for this case that I saw, single lady, two dogs. One was aggressive. One's just a regular Joe. Aggressive dog is biting her, is biting visitors. You can't make this up. Is biting the other dog. It gets worse. She lives in a one-bedroom apartment by herself. No significant other that even comes to stay with her. So I say, okay, this, she's opened up the door. I, I don't know what to do. She's crying. I don't know what to do. I'm sad. In, I'm more than her. I say, okay, well, let's just talk. What can we do right now? So here's what I know. So I've already done a physical. Like I've already, I already know this dog is also sick. That's another checkbox, right? And I say, okay, well, here's the thing. What I need you to do to be safe is you're going to live for about the next four to six weeks in protected contact, like at the zoo. He's going to be behind a baby gate, separated from your other dog and you. She was able to leash and muzzle pretty reliably. He muzzled up. And he should have a leash him. You're going to muzzle him. You're going to leash him. She doesn't have a yard. You're going to walk him in the back. He's going to go to the bathroom. He's going to come inside. I'm going to prescribe medications that are going to relieve his stress and make this easier on you. I'm going to give you ways that you can get him in and out safely. We're going to wait for our meds to work. We're going to set you up in the trainer. And then we're going to slowly add back in the skills he needs to live with you safely. He may never be able to meet visitors. I'm not even going there yet. That's an option. Rehoming is not an option. This dog doesn't have a breeder. There's no place for this dog to go. I make it real clear. This dog can't go to a shelter. Sanctuaries are unicorns. And there's a lot of ethical concerns around certain sanctuaries, depending, right? So I explain that to them. And then we talk about humane euthanasia. And I say, your dog's suffering. There's no doubt your dog's suffering. Let's just Forget it's a dog and, and and look at what your dog does. And now it's your best girlfriend. If I'm out with my best girlfriend, we're drinking martinis as we do, and she tells me that she hits her partner, she hits her mom. Anytime a visitor comes in her house, she tries to stab him with a knife. 
She cries all the time because she's upset. She's suffering. She, she's suffering. So we talk about the suffering that occurs when you have emotional disease. And we try to kind of broach it in that way. Yeah, that's I, I really love that. Are you ready for some free CE? Well, get ready to check CE off your back to school to-do list. Dr. Andy Rourke has invited some of his colleagues who he considers the best and the brightest in their fields to join him for a very special back to school webinar series. They're going to talk about some important advancements in veterinary care. Thanks to our friends at SEVA, Nationwide Pet Insurance, and Hills Pet Nutrition, you can level up your skills this fall with some free CE. To save your spot and join us live for the webinars, which start August 8th, and run through September, head over to the website at drandyrourke.com forward slash back to school to find out the times and dates and get all of the information and get yourself registered so that you can join Dr. Rourke and his friends for this exciting CE series. We can't wait to see you there. See, I was, I was going to, I was going to ask you about sort of managing guilt on the part of the pet owner. And I think, I think you really kind of already answered that question in a lot of ways because I, you know, it's, it's such an emotional decision for them. But I, I really love this idea of you can take the guilt away if you can get them to buy into the idea that their pet is suffering. I, I really like that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I guilt, I tell them, I tell people it's normal. Guilt, guilty, it's normal. Normal. But guilt doesn't move us forward. It's the, it's the opposite. The more we sit in guilt, the more we are stagnant. And I also tell them, and I did tell this to that that particular client, I said, you know, oncologists, oncologists get all the credit. I'm like, you've given this dog two years he would never have with anyone else. If an oncologist gets two <laughs> years out of a dog's lymphoma, they get a big Christmas basket full of cookies and candy, right? Like, come on. This dog has a disorder he had from puppyhood. Yeah. You gave him two years with a chronic disorder. Wow. Where's the wow in that? And I'm not saying all dogs should be euthanized. My God, or all cats with behavior problems. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that if we had this dog with chronic kidney disease and the pet parent couldn't, physically could not, forget money, okay, could not do the treatment. Who is going to stand in judgment of her? Mm. Who's going to do that? And if you are, then you better be prepared to adopt that dog into your home and do the treatment, right? Mm -hmm. So who is willing to do the treatment on this 90-pound dog? I, I'm not taking him into my home. That's for sure. You yeah. see what I'm saying? Yeah. Oh, definitely. Do you think that vet professionals struggle with these cases more or in a different way than pet owners do? I think they do. And I think my heart goes out to shelter workers. Yes. Because they really struggle. I recently had um, a shelter reach out to me and I, I meet with their medical director like once a month to consult. And she's, you know, she has a real hard time because mm -hmm. the morale goes down when one of these long-term cases that maybe is good with a couple of people there, but no one else can walk the dog. And she wants to clear that she wants to clear the space to bring another animal in that she can adopt out. And and yes, I think that we think of it differently, but it's only because we're not really thinking about behavior disorders as systemic disease, which is what they are. Yeah. Right? We're thinking about them as somehow in a separate bucket. And it's just not true. Yeah. That that absolutely makes sense. Um we're uh what mistakes do you think do you see most commonly GPs making? Are, are there are there are there are there pitfalls that we fall into? Uh, you know, I, I know everyone's trying to do their best, but are, are there places that you see uh, practitioners who are trying to support pet owners that that fumble or they make their lives harder than they have to be as they navigate this already challenging time? Yeah, I think that first of all, we need to forgive ourselves. There are some days where I have bad days bad days, where I have days I'm not at my best. And by the end of the day, by the millionth appointment, I'm not as patient as I should be, right? So we have to first forgive ourselves for whatever mistakes we make. If I back up from that and I say, well, well how can we be better? Don't judge. Clients hear you. They, you say all these wonderful things. Then the client pushes you with that question I wish they would never ask. 
what would you do if this was your dog? And then you know you shouldn't answer, yeah. but you're tired. You're tired. And you say, I would not live with this dog. That's all they remember. Then they come to the specialist and say, my vet said I should euthanize my dog. And they get, I think your vet said more than that, but okay. So let's not, number one, let's not put ourselves into someone else's place except to empathize, mm-hmm. right? And number two, let's not judge because, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. We've all done, done this in VetNet. One of my residents saw this patient. The patient is a dog living in a household with other dogs. This dog was tearing the other dogs up. And so she gave the first recommendation. You always give separate dogs for safety while we get this plan in place. The client went home, came back to the next recheck, didn't separate the dogs. There was another fight. And this happened for about three appointments. So it was real easy for the vet, for my resident to go, what's wrong with this lady? What's wrong with her? Like, yeah. she obviously doesn't care about the dog. Maybe I should report her to animal control. This is animal abuse. She's mad, right? So by the fourth appointment, the lady says, no, my, my husband has terminal cancer. And my husband will not separate these dogs. And I just want you to know that. Yeah. Okay. Well, God. If we had maybe asked differently or had some empathy in the beginning and said, explain to me why you don't feel comfortable separating, because I know that you know it's it's safest. So what is happening? And and then I usually say, you don't have to tell me if you don't want to. Yeah. But if you do, sometimes it can be helpful. So it's hard when you're tired to find that space to to do that. But let's not judge and let's not put ourselves in that in a space where we're making a decision for someone. Yeah. I, uh, I just had a case last week with this cat that came in and it's a four-year-old cat and it's, it's gained two pounds in six months. And so it's, it's a 10 pound cat. Now it's eight pound cat. And now it's, it's 10 and change. And I, I saw this chart and I'm like, what in the world are they doing with this poor cat? And so I go in to kind of give them, give them a hard time about, you know, the fact that they're letting this cat gain weight and do these things. And, and very quickly is, is a wonderful lady. And she was like, Oh, no, this is my dad's cat. And he loves this cat and he has dementia. And whenever the cat yells, he gives her treats and then he forgets that he's given her yeah. treats. And we kind of had a good hearted chuckle at like, Oh, she's got him. She's got him trained. Um, but again, you, you, when you understand the context of what's going on, it doesn't, doesn't change the fact that, and I don't want this cat to continue to gain 25% of her body weight every time I see her, but I also understand where this person's coming from and I can be, I can be kinder, I can be better. And so, you know, I, I, I love that. Uh, Dr. Radasa, you are amazing. I so appreciate your time and you being here. Uh, you do so many things. You have written so many books. Uh, you present all over the place. Where, where can people find you online? Where can they, where can they learn more? Uh, so they can go to Dr. Lisa Radasta. Dot com. They can go to uh, Instagram or Facebook at Dr. Lisa Radosta. If it's a veterinary healthcare professional, you might like what we put on LinkedIn. And then we have our website, which is flvetbehavior.com. And the reason I bring up our website, even if you live you know, uh, across the world, is that we have handouts and videos that, we, um, that are meant for pet parents. So if you don't know what to say, that might be on our website. You can send the pet parent there or to our YouTube channel and and you'll get what you need. That's so that's so awesome. I love the stuff that you put out for pet owners as well. It's always great to have good resources to send people to because you know that they're going to search online, and so you could just to be able to point them in a in a good supportive way. That that's awesome. Thank you so much for being here, guys. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, take care of yourselves, everybody. And that is it, guys. That's what we got for you. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you got something out of the episode. Thanks so much to uh, Dr. Lisa Rodasta for being here. Thanks to you for being here and listening. Um, yeah, if you like the podcast, do me a favor. Uh, leave me an honest review wherever you get your podcast. It means the world to me. Anyway, that's all I got. Gang, take care of yourselves. Be well. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.